Okay, now we're to the last step here. Here, we're going to say if x equals some value. Uh, let's just make that value 0.75. Uh, I just picked that out of the sky. So let's say our x is 0.75. What would our y be according to our equation? So we're just going to go over to cell G7 and type in um, some commands, just an equation that will always give us the right answer, no matter what we put in E7. So let's give that a shot. What we'd do, well, our equation is y equals 0.513 plus 4.0748 x, and our x is what's ever in E7. So we'll just put this in Excel terms. So what we'd do is we'd type an equal sign, then we'd click on cell E5, or you could just type in E5, whichever one's easier for you. Then type in a plus sign, then a left parenthesis, then we could type in, or we could actually just click on our slope, which is 4.0747. In other words, whatever number is in E4. So you either type in E4 or you click on E4. And then you put an asterisk, which means multiply. An asterisk is Shift 8. Then we're going to click on E7, which is where we're putting in our X value. Then we close our parenthesis and press Enter. Now once we've done that, that will tell us the predicted value. That's saying if a student came to us and we knew their hardiness score at the beginning when they started the school was 0.75, then we'd predict their first year GPA to be 3.10. Now you might be saying, but wait a minute, if I look over there on the left, there is a student got 0.75 hardiness score, and his or her GPA wasn't 3.1073, it was 3.42. Well, that's because our predictions aren't perfect. They're just not perfect. If our R score was 1, our predictions would be perfect. Even if it was a negative 1 for an R score. But if our R is, if the number following the sign for our R score is less than 1, then our predictions won't be perfect. Let's, uh, let's type in another number where the 0 0.75 is. So we're going to say, let's try 0.68. So actually, let's take a look. We've got three students that have 0.68. So we'll, type, we'll take a look at those before we'll type it in and see what we predict. There were three students that got a hardiness score of 0.68. The first student had a GPA at the end of first year of 2.61. The second one, though, got a different GPA, 3.1. The third student got even a, a different one, 3.05. So that means these students differ maybe in how much other responsibilities they have, how much effort they put into uh, school. There's a lot of different things that will affect their GPA, not just their hardiness score. So all these different students, even though they start out with the same hardiness score, they're going to get slightly different GPAs. Let's now put in 0.68 and see what our equation would be. So we'll just type 0.68 in cell E7, and then when we hit Enter, the number in cell G7 will automatically change to match our new number. So our regression line would predict a GPA of 2.82. So our regression line predicted a higher GPA than the first student actually got, but a lower GPA than the second or third students. So our guess is kind of in the middle of those students. Of it overguessed uh, the GPA for one and underguessed it for two. So it, it was pretty reasonable. And that's kind of what a regression line is. It's the best fitting line that fits in the middle of all your data. Okay, so now we have all this information. 
let's do some hypothesis testing to see if this is significant, if, if this much of a difference and our score of this high for a sample tells us that there's a difference in the population. Our hypothesis testing step, I always start with step two, just because I'm weird. I uh, start with the alternative hypothesis, and that's that rho, that is, rho looks like a P, but it's really the Greek letter for R, and it's spelt R-H-O, but and pronounced rho, even though it looks like a P. But what it really means is the cor correlation of the entire population. So if we had all the members of the population and calculated a correlation rather than just a sample. And in this case, we're saying it would not be zero. In other words, there would be a relationship. We could write now the uh, null hypothesis, or HO, which is just that rho equals zero. In other words, if it doesn't not equal zero, then it must equal zero. And those two things cover all possibilities. Now let's go to step three. In step three, all we do is we set our alpha. And we'll use the conventional 0.05. So we'll say alpha equals 0.05. This is almost what it always is set at. Sometimes I'll use 0.01. And in very rare cases, they'll use 0.001, sometimes 0.1, but almost always 0.05. So we're going to go with 0.05. Now we do our rejection rule. And step four is rejection rule, colon, reject the null hypothesis if the absolute value of R comp is greater than or equal to some number. Now where do we get that number? Well, in this case, it turns out it's probably easiest to get it from the appendix in the back of our statistical book. Now, at the time of the recording, uh, at this present time where I'm recording, table is table E. But since the editions of the books change, it may be different for you. But there should be a table that has the critical values of R scores. And here's what it looks like at the present time. It tells you that the degrees of freedom equal n minus 2, where n is the number of pairs of scores. Then it's got a column for degrees of freedom. It's got a column for point uh, for the 5%, which is the same as 0 0.05. And it's got a column for 1%, which is the same as 0 0.01 for an alpha. So if the degrees of freedom are n minus 2, and we had 15 scores, well, 15 minus 2 equals 13. So we have to go down our degrees of freedom column until we come to 13. I've underlined that row in red for you. So our degrees of freedom are 13, and our alpha was 0.05, so we go to the 5% column, and we find our critical value is 0.514. So this is what we put in our step. So our rejection rule is reject the null hypothesis if the absolute value of R comp is greater than or equal to 0.514.